It has seemingly been forever since we could say this. It's game week. USC, week zero. There we go. San Jose State, uh, Pac-12 Network at the Coliseum. And USC looking to wrap up its Pac-12 history with a championship. Of course, this game does not affect the conference race, but of course is needed to set up USC where they want to land. And that would be the college football playoff. We appreciate you all being here. Trojans Live, a 66th edition with Matt Zemek from Trojans Wire. So we appreciate you being here. Leave those comments and questions there in the chat. We will preview San Jose State tonight. Matt, how you doing? I'm doing well. And just those two words, they're beautiful words. Game week. Uh, we made it. We made it through the offseason again. And especially with all the silliness and the absurdity in college sports right now, we really need games. And Please, folks, no realignment breaking news on Saturdays, I hope. I hope. We can all dream. Please, 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 please. Let's just focus and enjoy football. That's why we're ultimately here. So once again, we appreciate you all being here. Please consider the Super Chat. And again, comments and questions are welcome. Well, we're going to dive right into the analysis and set up uh, the San Jose State game. We've got another Matt, Matt Weiner. Joining us from the Spear at San Jose State, uh, Matt. We appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, uh, we can start in this fashion. Uh, Brent Brennan uh, was able to get through a successful season last year, get his team to a bowl game. Uh, it was a rough start for him. Uh, lost twenty-two of his first twenty-five games. Oh uh, has has really had to take one of the worst. Uh, FPS programs and build it uh, from the ground up now entering his seventh season, just your evaluation of what has been successful for him and how he's been able to build this program. Yeah, I think it's amazing the way he's done it is just that classic roundup approach. And I'll be doing a story on this pretty shortly, but like a lot of this was not through cliche culture building, a lot of it was through just connection with the team and building connections in between players. And so I'll have a story on that coming out with the spear later this week that really dives into that. But my evaluation is, look, he took something that was historically just not great. You could say it flat out bad. And now he's on the precipice of, get this, coming the first coach in SJSU history to reach three bowl games. Matt, we can uh, just go back and forth if you'd like. So go right into it. Yeah. So, you know, didn't, I've done a little bit of reading. I won't say I've done an exhaustive amount of reading. I've had to cover realignment as well as USC. Um, but in what I've read about San Jose State, uh, it seems as though one of the question marks is the offensive line. And if, if that, if you agree with that, it sets up a fascinating situation on Saturday because if there's a position group for USC, which is a question mark, it's the defensive line. So we could have question mark versus question mark uh, when we have the San Jose State O-line against the USC D-line. Size up that matchup, and do you think that that thesis uh, that the offensive line is really the, you know, the that's kind of like the hinge point for San Jose State this season if, if, you, if you think uh, that's actually the case? Right. So I was asking a mailbag column, like, who do you think – expect who do I expect to have the biggest jump from or expect to see the biggest improvement well it's the offensive line because they were not good last year just straight up they allowed a ton of sacks they had SJSU had a ton of trouble running the ball in that bowl game they had multiple fourth and short stops one of them was like on the three yard line or in the third and goal and that definitely put them back and is a reason why they lost to Eastern Michigan but you come into this year where you have three out of the five guys coming back, Jaime Navarro, Anthony Pardue, and then Fernando Carmona Jr. And there's a lot of experience between those guys. So the hope is that, look, you had another offseason. You have tons of film to watch and tons of things to learn from. You pretty much have the same offensive line coach, same offensive coordinator, same running backs coach. It is your time to build. Matt, now, uh, oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was just going to move straight from that offensive line. And as you mentioned, uh, I, I'm looking at the rushing numbers at 3.3 yards per carry kind of underlines what you're talking about. That's a horrendous number at any level of football, but especially in college football, uh, that uh, there was a lot put on the shoulders of quarterback Chevin Cordero last season, 23 touchdowns, six interceptions. He's got a ton of experience. It's been a long time, you know, from a college perspective, again, since he first won the job. Uh, just talk about what he brings to the table and how he threatens the uh, USC defense. Yeah, like he, what he comes to the table with is experience. So right now he has 68 career passing touchdowns. He's 26 away from tying the Mountain West record. Now, part of that is because he goes way back to USC. He's in his final year of eligibility. So he at least has the wherewithal and just understanding of how to be in a difficult situation. So that's what I do like about Shevin is that he knows what he's dealing with. Obviously, it's not his first rodeo. Um, but the thing that I'm curious to see is how he adapts to a bunch of his wide to his biggest wide receiver from last year and a couple other ones not being there anymore. So that's kind of the biggest question mark SJSU or excuse me, USC fans should be looking at great quarterback, but he has a lot of unproven talent at wide receiver. So Matt, one of the things I wanted to follow up on when we look at the San Jose state offense in particular, the offensive line. Okay. There's continuity. All right. Mm -hmm. Relative to last season, you have personnel players and coaches coming back. How much of an internal debate or discussion was there in the off season with Brent Brennan uh, about retaining his coaches, because, you know, sometimes if you retain mediocrity, it's not good to be bringing personnel back. It would be better to have a lot of turnover. USC fans can relate because he wanted to clean out what Clay Helton left behind. Lincoln Riley wanted to bring in something dramatically new and he did, and it worked. So what's the balance in terms of, well, it's good that we have personnel coming back, but hmm, maybe more changes were in order in the offseason. What's been the debate within the San Jose State football community on that point? Yeah, I mean, I would say as far as from my end, I haven't done much reporting into kind of some of those specific retainment questions and just possibilities, everything like that. I really just flat out don't have information on that as far as that goes. But, I mean, I am curious to see if, let's say, you have just a stinker of a season, three and nine, what happens to that? And so there's always things like that. But, yeah, so I don't have any information on my end about those conversations. What's your sense of the of the situation, though, just as an analyst, as someone who followed this program? And, you know, I, I caught some San Jose State football after USC games ended, and I know that San Jose State was in some real scraps some real dogfights with teams that, frankly, should expect to beat handily. Uh, have had some close games against teams from the lower end of the Mountain West. So there certainly does seem to be uh, a feeling that, you know, last year's group didn't you know, quite uh, match standards and expectations. Uh, how much pressure is there to be noticeably better this season and, and, and push the program in the right direction? All right. So I do think that there is – uh, pressure on a certain point and this is kind of a new perspective to really start looking into that I mean it's so difficult to see with some of these things because like so uh, coach Brennan has been with his offensive coordinator they go back to Oregon State so that was like many years ago so there is continuity there and closeness there so yeah I mean that's something I'm curious about seeing is we know how quickly this thing goes up and down up and down and so if the running game is great then Brennan Right, like Brennan's a genius for bringing back the offensive line coach and running backs coach. So uh, it's another thing to be curious about. Matt, looking at the, uh, you know what? Actually, I want to make uh, one other note about the offense before we kind of move it around and we go back to to Matt. Uh, a, a name that popped up in looking at the personnel was Jay Butterfield because Pac-12 fans will be familiar with. Uh, his recruitment to Oregon because he was one of the most highly sought after quarterbacks in his class and one of the highest commits ever uh, signed at Oregon. Now he obviously with Bo Nix coming in and before that Tyler Shook gaining the job was not able to break through at Oregon, but is, is there any, 
obviously we're in game week and Cadero's maintained the job and he's got a ton of experience, but uh, Jay Butterfield has obviously got to be considered the future at this point. Yeah. I mean, this season is very clear. Shedden's the guy. There is no debate. Like every, any, like that's just something that's not even like a topic of conversation in the case. And I've said this from the beginning in the case that Shevin goes down, Jay Butterfield has to step up has to step up and be that guy that SJSU brought him in to be. And if, and the interesting point is if Shevin struggles, to what point of Shevin struggles is somebody like, is Jay Butterfield going to come in? That's another, that's the point. But 2023, Shevin came in as a 2023 Mountain West preseason offensive player of the year. This is his team, like no consideration. And that's not anything to discredit Jay and what he's coming, but, it's it's seven time to shine. So in this uh, opening game against USC, you know we know that uh, Shevin Cordero and Justin Lockhart, like that's expected to be the main pitch and catch combination for the Spartans, and Lockhart's going to be Cordero's number one target. Now, it, obviously at USC, one of the really uh, good things that Lincoln Riley has brought to the program in a very short period of time. Lots of depth at wide receiver. There's so many options, so many people that Caleb Williams can spread the ball to. After Justin Lockhart, is there a clear number two option for San Jose State? Mm-hmm. What's that situation looking like? And how is that going to affect the way uh, Cordero distributes the ball and finds other options when you know that defenses are going to send a lot of bodies uh, Lockhart's way? Yeah, I mean, this is something that I've covered extensively this offseason, and it's the story of Nick Nash transitioning from QB to wide receiver and from spring ball to even fall camp when I was out, out last week. He is, he is really shown out, and he is making legitimate contested catches. I mean, Ma, I guess I'm Moss a guy last week, and so he's obviously putting work in, and there's a chemistry between the two, like, both Shevin and Nick are roommates with each other. They did a story about how they they play ping pong every day. Like they're just having these crazy ping pong living room matches. And I think, honestly, this is my bold prediction, but I think that Nick Nash will have either more receiving yards or more catches than Lockhart. For the season or against USC or both? Uh, I'm going to say – I'm curious. I'll, I'll say for the season by the end, but that's, that's another thing I'm looking forward to seeing. How does that ball get distributed? All right. Another question about the matchup between uh, the San Jose state offense and USC defense. And Hey, if we're peppering you with questions about the San Jose state <laughs> offense, because huh, we at USC, we're not worried about our offense. We're worried about our defense. So trying yeah. to give our USC fans as much Intel about the San Jose state offense as possible. How do you think Brennan and the staff are going to manage this game? Because there are a couple obvious schools of thought, you know, a couple obvious avenues to consider. One is you try and hit the big play against a defense, which was vulnerable to the big play. And you try to get a, get a lead and you try and make USC sweat, maybe panic, you know, maybe a few weird things happen and you get like that Appalachian state Michigan uh, vibe from 2007 or, the other route, and this is what Rice did in the season opener against USC one year ago, and that's run it up the gut, try to, you know, seven get seven, eight-minute drives, you know, just keep uh, Caleb Williams holding his helmet on the sideline. You try to shorten the game. And, of course, this year in college football, we have the rule change with running clock on first down. So, like, if San Jose State can mash a little bit and get first downs, that's going to – uh, run even more time with with the clock not stopping on first down. So of those two avenues, which which one do you think the San Jose State staff is going to pursue and which one do you think the staff should pursue? I mean, it's so hard because I have nothing to – obviously I've seen lots of practice, but until you see a game, it's so hard to decipher what the coaches are thinking. That's kind of hard on my end, but I think the smartest thing to do, honestly, play it safe. Play it safe. I mean, US, uh, SJC was phenomenal when it came to turnovers last season. Like, their nine turnovers were the best in the Mountain West and third in the nation. 
Shevin Cordero was amongst the best quarterbacks in the nation when it came to not throwing picks. So if I'm them, honestly, it's just let's play this safe. Hopefully this offensive line and the veteran presence of running back Kyrie Robinson and then transfer portal um, running back. They just added Quali Conley from Utah Tech. Hopefully they could get something going in the run game and that opens up just that one big play. But my biggest thing is play safe for the most part when it comes to just don't turn the ball over. I mean, I feel this is these situations all the time where things are going well the first quarter, boom, on a punt return, the guy drops it, the guy flubs it. Now USC is on the SJSU's 15-yard line. That's two plays, and boom, the game's over. Hey, Matt, uh, while our Matt is going to focus on yeah. the offense versus the USC defense, I'm going to flip over and make – the impossible situation and see what we can come up with there. So your defensive coordinator in Derek Odom, uh, he plays this fill and flex defense. I see uh, now fill and flex. I, I don't know if that means they're going to have like 13 guys on the field to try to defend Caleb Williams. I don't know if that's maybe the, uh, the strategy, if they can kind of sneak a couple of guys extra on the field, but uh, you know, just give us some insight into this San Jose state defense and how they may play it against uh, Caleb Williams and company. Yeah, I mean, this is another thing. And I keep using the word curious, but it's because I haven't seen all of them. Like, I just haven't seen them on the field. And so that's what this is. But the part that I think could be scary for SJSU and USC fans will love to hear this. USC fans will be head over heels to hear this. Okay. SJSU is missing some of its most foundational pillars of the initial rebuild. Junior Fajoko was amongst one of, had, was top five in sacks last year. He's playing for the Cowboys. Fellow, his book, and on the other side, Cade Hall, he was amongst one of the best um, just defensive players in SJSU history. He's no longer there. Kyle Linebacker Kyle Harmon, well, he's gone. He was top five in tackles. And then cornerback Nehemiah Shelton, well, he's now an unsigned free agent with the Jets. So you're looking at a bunch of guys to fill in, and it's just how will these new guys come in their place. So you have linebacker Brian Parham. Um, this will be his third season, was second on the team in tackles last season. Um, nose guard Solon Toya. You hope that he could do something up front. But once again, like there is talent where it's like, okay, it is really just kind of baptized by fire, where it's like, you guys got to be the guy. And so that's what USC fans would love to hear because I'm sure Caleb Williams would be a would not would rather face this than of course last year and then yeah see the comment chase williams is obviously back so that adds some veteran presence that helps um, his fellow safety trey jenkins he's been with the team since 2018 so there is some but i mean it's something that can really be taken apart so in this season opener, you know, what uh, which position group do you think you know, needs the, to see the most where it is that needs uh, the most information in terms of, OK, USC provides this measuring stick. Let's see how good we are. Let's see where we come up short. Let's see how, how we where we really have to evolve going forward. And of course, you have Oregon State coming right after USC, that CBS uh, special. Uh, on Sunday, uh, September 3rd in, in uh, sure. week one. So what do you think uh, this team needs to learn the most about its defensive personnel for the Oregon State game and for the rest of the season so that this team can, you know, get value? Like no one's expecting San Jose State to win, of course. But like w what are the goals in terms of evolution and improvement mm -hmm. that San Jose State's really looking for on the defensive side of the ball in this game? That's a good question because the evolution of it is so difficult because you're expecting to take a step back. Like that's what happens when you lose so many key players. What I want to see honestly is so much of that front seven. How do you guys one go through these two rough games and then also maintain throughout the rest of the season? I want to see how Solon Toya does. I want to see how guys like defensive lineman Jake Akiva does. I want to see how guys like Elijah Wood does or how he, how he will play. That is what I'm most looking forward to, and I think other fans should be as well, because this is a tough season. 
after these two difficult non-conference games, like we just mentioned, SAC will then play five of the six highest ranked teams in the Mountain West preseason poll. If you don't have a front seven, well, then you could kiss bowl eligibility goodbye. How much? Oh, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, man. How much do you think uh, Brennan and the staff are going to rotate bodies in this game? You know, how much do you think it's important to ride the starters, especially given that uncertain situation, you know, losing NFL caliber talent? Do you think the staff's going to try and ride some guys a lot just to give them extended reps and see see what they have in them? Or do you think because, precisely because you have a front-loaded schedule, it's going to be the coaching staff's going to feel it's important. You know what? Let's not overextend anyone and let's make sure that lots of people get playing time so that we have options and we can really, you know, reconsider the depth chart as we go along and we can get more evaluations of more players. Which way do you think Brennan and the staff are going to go in this game against USC? Yeah, I think for this initial one, there might be just a little bit of experimentation early on and seeing how playing, how things are in that. It's kind of like in, in MMA where the guys kind of feel each other out, see what moves are working, see what needs to be done, and then kind of just attack from there. Similar thing, but I mean, in my opinion, if we're heading into, if it's a one to two possession game, mm-hmm. we're heading into the fourth quarter, play the hot hand. I'm sorry, this win can mean so much for this program. And look, I know that there's a high chance this SAC will not upset literally number six USC in the Coliseum. But if this does, that means a lot if we're talking money-wise for donors and NIL and recruiting. So this one means so much if it can happen. So play the hot hand. Play the hot hand. This could mean a lot going forward, just beyond the one win. Anything else, Matt? No, I mean, I've pretty much touched on it and just it's been great seeing Brent Brennan's rebuild and – like I said, seven and five might not seem great. Like USC goes seven and five this year, there would be some people on Twitter calling for Riley's job. But if Brennan goes seven and five this year, makes the third his third bowl appearance, which is literally the which will be the first time in SJSU history a coach a head coach does that. I mean, that's like borderline statue status for SJSU. <laughs> And you've had Dick Tomey and other really credential coaches come through that program over the years. So that would be a phenomenal achievement. Yes, of course, Mike McIntyre, the latest to head an 11 win season in 2012 that set him up for the Colorado job. Exactly. Uh, Very good. Matt Weiner, you can catch him at the Spear, San Jose State. Uh, Matt, we want to make sure that everyone's aware of your work and where they can find you, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's all right there at Matt Weiner 20. Keep up with my stories on the SpearSJSU.com, Twitter at the SpearSJSU. And real quick, I guess this last thing is that I'm a student beat reporter, and I think it's really important that we just kind of always be cognizant of student beat reporters and student journalism. Like, I'm not getting paid to do this. This is literally just a class, but I enjoy doing it. So I always like to make sure I throw that into some of these appearances. Thank you so much, Matt. We appreciate you being here. Enjoy the game. And we hope for your side that it's competitive in that one to two score game into the fourth quarter. Maybe that uh, comes to fruition. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it, Matt. Yeah. All right. Good to talk football. Good to talk game preview. Love that. After, after. After eight months in the wilderness, you know, and it's it's obviously like it's like manna in the desert, you know, manna from heaven every year. But this year it really feels extra uh, important be, just because of all the absurdity that we've had to go through the past two months, the death of the Pac-12 and all that other stuff. So, yeah, we, we definitely made it. So it does. You know, I was just so going to say the- for as long as this offseason has been and they all are. Uh, the longest off season of any sport, we we didn't even catch a breath to be able to talk about like some really fun historical things and player rankings and all time rankings and that sort of thing. Do the typical <laughs> off season 
type content. We were just wrapped up in all this transfer portal and then right into, of course, uh, realignment craziness. Absolutely. So now we get to turn the page. And I did tell folks, you know, la the last few weeks were realignment heavy because that was big news. But now we get to turn the page and get to focus on football. And we're going to live up to that commitment here at the Voice of College Football. So, you know, from a USC perspective on this San Jose State opener, I think a, a question that a lot of USC fans, people in the chat, our friends, Tim Prangley and Rick and I at Trojan Conquest Live, a lot of people are wondering, you know, what does a successful opener look like and i and i have three basic pillars three basic components in terms of what a successful uh opener looks like one is just you know get through it healthy that's kind of obvious so that's kind of a throw but like the two really big keys one is wrap up the game by halftime you know first five minutes of the third quarter it is so important in this first half of the season schedule going all the way through october 7 against arizona so important to put teams away early so that you rotate bodies and you get, you know, evenly distributed snap counts. You, you evaluate a lot of players. Nobody's getting overextended and you have a team that's going to be fundamentally fresh entering the Notre Dame, Utah, Washington, Oregon, you know, four games in five weeks. That's going to be a grind. This, this team plays nine straight weeks, week four, September 23rd at ASU through UCLA on November 18th, USC is going to have to put teams away early to get backups and third stringers ample work. And that's also, of course, going to serve as program building for 2024 in the Big Ten. Like that's how the elite programs do it. They, they win those cupcake games very easily and they're able to get tons of looks at all their players on the roster and, you know, we, we have to bring up that last year, part of what left USC overcooked in that Pac-12 championship game against Utah, uh, you know, after having after winning stressful games against UCLA and Notre Dame in those previous two weeks leading up to the Pac-12 title game, not being able to put away Cal, you know, being up three scores, but then let, allowing that game to be a one score game deep into the fourth quarter. OK, it was a win. And that is the most important thing. But. The starters had to be in until the very end of that game. Couldn't put away Arizona, led by 16, had other chances to win that game very comfortably in Tucson, but eh, went down to the final few minutes, and that caught up with them. It did. You know, you, too many guys, too many starters playing too many snaps against teams that, frankly, should have been, you know, killed off much earlier in those games, and, and USC was spent. USC was a spent team in the second half, you know, Larry Pilgrim knows knows this, that Utah was deeper, tougher, fresher for that game in Las Vegas, uh, knocked the Trojans out of the playoff. So, you know, what, what represents a culture change and what represents a new and better way of doing things? Not just winning the game, but winning it easily, taking care of business quickly and efficiently. USC has to develop that habit starting with this San Jose State opener, and that habit needs to continue through the Arizona game. And if USC can establish that good habit, then there's going to be a lot more fuel in the tank for Notre Dame, Utah, Washington, and Oregon. So that's one really key component of what a successful San Jose State game looks like. And then the other component, the defensive line. The defensive line, particularly against the run, you know, being able to establish right off the bat, no, we're not going to be shoved around. And, you know, people are going to say, but it's only San Jose State. Let's remember last year, Rice, on its first three, four drives of that season opener, did mash the ball up front. And USC's defensive line struggled. And that was a sign of things to come. And so it, even though it's only San Jose State, all right, and then this game isn't going to be remotely close in the fourth quarter, Nevertheless, it's important for this defensive line to come out and establish those run fits, plug the middle, and and make sure that that you know you're not going to beat us up the gut. You're not going to beat us up the a gap. You're not going to be able to beat us by just sledgehammering the ball. No, we we can actually flex our muscles a little bit. We can show strength at the point of attack. It's only San Jose State, but still, like it, it, okay, 
because it's only San Jose State, you better d- display a certain degree of competence. And Alex Grinch and this unit have to begin to make the right statement. Now, let's be clear. No one's going to say or imply that, oh, if, they, if USC shuts down San Jose State and controls the Spartans' offensive line, the, oh, this defense is, is on its way, all right? No one's saying that. But the, the, import, the important point is don't get pushed around by San Jose State. Don't get shoved around at the line of scrimmage. USC has to at least meet a certain standard on that defensive line to set a, a, at least something of a good tone for you know the subsequent weeks. And you know USC has an off week on September 16th. Really important in these first three games: San Jose State, then Nevada, then Stanford. You know to enter that that off week in mid September, having a much better idea of where you stand and having you know, a, a reasonable degree of confidence uh, in your personnel and what you can do. So like, the, you know, it's a 12 game season, but in many ways, the, the first three games are kind of a mini season. And it's important in the, in a three game, you know, small sample size bundle for USC to begin to get the right trajectory, to begin to get the right habits. Another part, uh, and this is where Matt Weiner's analysis was, I found, I found uh, it to be really valuable that San Jose State doesn't turn the ball over much. Good. That's really good. That makes this opener, I think, a good test because one of the things that USC ran into last year was when the opponent doesn't turn the ball over. You know, when you don't have Chance Nolan of Oregon State playing Santa Claus and gift wrapping four interceptions for the Trojans, when you don't have someone just handing out cotton candy to the Trojan defense – and you don't have an offense that's just spilling uh, turnovers left and right, what's the defense going to do? Can the defense get three and outs? Can the defense get off the field on third and fourth down? Something we definitely didn't see against Tulane in the Cotton Bowl. So San Jose State, could, you know, if it doesn't commit a turnover, can this USC defense get a lot of three and outs, stack a lot of good possessions uh, against each other without, you know, getting the takeaway, without getting the interception, without raking the ball away, you know, can you make the sure tackle in open space, getting a running back or a wide receiver down two, three yards short of the marker, or does he slip through the tackle, convert the first down, and you just have those cotton bowl nightmares flooding back. So getting the game done early to give the backups work and the defense showing competence in terms of, you know, run fits, sure tackling, and getting three and outs. Those really are the two main components of of what a successful opener looks like against San Jose State. Matt, to complement what you just said about what you're looking for in this USC opener, this is what I'm looking for with with a few things to consider. To your point, there is more to be gleaned on the negative side, unfortunately, in games like this than from the positive. If USC goes out there and wipes out San Jose State, 55 to 10, that's great. They did what they're supposed to do. Uh, But we have to question San Jose State, of course, to a large degree. And we're looking at a lower half-tier team in the Mountain West. But if USC goes out there and struggles, and it's that one-score game that he talked about going into the fourth quarter, (laughs) and they win it 38-23, but it's really a sloppy effort, then it's it's like, okay, well, maybe they weren't sharp, focused, on point, knowing that they could get by, or maybe there are some real concerns. So there's, there's, there's more to be gleamed on the negative side, unfortunately. That said, regardless of what USC does offensively, obviously we can, we can take from the performance, but if, if they go out there and have you know, their worst performance under Caleb Williams, I'm not going to be that concerned. I'm going to have to see it twice. I would have to see it next time, most likely in game <laughs> three against Stanford to, to really believe that's that's that there are concerns on that side of the ball. I'm totally focused on the defense. I'm focused yeah, on a same. few things that you hit on. We're looking at a team that averaged 3.3 <laughs> yards rushing per rush last season in San Jose State. We're talking about a poor rushing team. In college football, that's an anemic number. And sure, they bring back some offensive linemen, and they should be able to improve on that. But still, USC needs to put pressure on an experienced quarterback who 
would be a capable quarterback in the back 12, but he would be in the bottom three or four for sure. In regards to the, you know, they are f- going to be facing the best quarterback conference in college football up yeah. ahead. So certainly they need to put pressure on the quarterback. I want to see that these defensive backs are number one uh, on their assignments, that the secondary is on their assignments. They're not blowing coverages. And then also when they're on their assignments, they're, you know, hanging with receivers. They're, they're playing tight coverage. They're playing well, good technique. And as you mentioned, wrapping up tackles, crisp tackling with the consideration that good football teams typically do improve. And I know it's cliche, but it only makes sense if you have capable coaching do improve the most from game one to game two, because it's your first outing to be able to say, Hey, this is what we did under stress for the first time in a long time. Now we're going to apply what needs to be done to improve. And then you see that jump in inefficiency and in crispness into that second game. So I don't, I'm not going to be over analyzing it from that standpoint. Everybody's a little bit sloppy in week one, but still, you know, this, this defense, uh, these guys are smart. They read social media. They, they can read statistics they know that their performance was not good last year. They they know what it feels like to be an athlete on a field. You know when you've won a play, when you've beat your opponent, not just the total 11 opponents on the other side, but your one-on-one matchup and you know when you were when you were beaten, when you were toast and that was far too often for USC. So those defenders know that their collective performance was not good last year. Let's see if they have the pride and they've put in the work that they can now take to the field to improve on those mistakes from last year. One thing that you raised, you know, just listening to you talk and making some astute points. One thing I'm really interested in, you know, Tim Prangley, he's in here in the chat, co-host of Trojan Conquest Live, and he's going to be part of the uh, USC postgame show after the game this Saturday with Rick and I and Tony Altimore. So, the game is 5 o'clock in Los Angeles, 8 in the East. So it's going to end around 8.30 in L.A., 11.30 in the East. That's when you want to head on over to the USC postgame show with Tim, Rick, and Tony. But anyway, one of the things Tim has noted throughout the offseason, guys are bigger, guys are thicker. You know, that, that Benny Wiley's strength uh, and conditioning program is taking root a little bit more. Uh, In year two, you know, you're not going to get it all fully formulated in year one. You need a second year of that training, of that regimen. And, you know, so the point of Tim's analysis with with guys being bigger and thicker, it could be that Alex Grinch was teaching for the turnover in year one because he felt like, you know, he didn't have the dudes. Also, guys weren't as physically developed as he knew they would eventually be for you know, players being retained into year two, um, you know, was Grinch being particularly situational in year one by teaching to the turnover rather than, you know, a more tac- sure tackling uh, based focus on defense, or is Grinch going to continue to teach to the turnover in year two? That is definitely something to watch for because you know, USC was a very good ball hawking defense last year the amazing turnover differential and it certainly helped the team in those first six weeks of the season but you know was Grinch giving away a little bit too much over the course of the full season was that emphasis on teaching for the turnover you know something that you know was overplayed Grinch uh, overplayed his hand um, and and he didn't coach enough to teach the sure tackle uh, to teach wrapping up to teach making the safe uh, hit because USC now has year two of that strength and conditioning program, are we going to see modifications in how Grinch teaches his defense? That's going to be a very interesting plot point. I know it's going to be something that I'm going to be talking about with you, Mark, but also uh, with Tim and Rick and Tony uh, over the course of this season. It's, It's a fascinating plot point to watch. Matt and I get together to produce uh, exclusive Trojan Conquest, 
tent. So what that is, is for you members here on the USC channel at the Boys of College Football, you know that if you're one of the top two tier members that uh, Matt and I deliver some really good conversations, really good insight on a USC related topics in college football. We've got about 12 segments available for all of you. These are not just quick 30 second takes. These are in-depth analysis on crucial topics to the college football world in general that apply specifically to USC or USC centric topics and some really interesting, I got to say topics and storylines, narratives that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, that Matt and I put together each and every week for you. So again, there's about 12 of those segments available here at the Boys of College Football. Just go to the front page of the channel here and get your YouTube Boys of College Football uh, membership on the USC channel. Have we pretty much wrapped it up in regards to the uh, the game coming up this Saturday, Matt? Can we turn to the news of the day? Absolutely. All right. So, so Jen, Jen Cohen, and, and as the new athletic director at USC, and I will admit I was not expecting this. Jen Cohen was not on my radar screen in terms of top choices. Now, got to say, Tony Altimore, if you remember when we discussed uh, the USC AD opening, Jen Cohen was on his big board. He was, uh, She was in the uh, world-class ADs uh, subsection of Tony's uh, big board. Now, if you ask me personally – I would have preferred Heather Like of Pittsburgh. I, you know, Pat and Pat Chun would have been the ideal candidate, but I'm realistic here that Ohio State seems like the, you know, the natural obvious choice ever since Gene Smith uh, announced that he was retiring. You know, Pat Chun to Ohio State makes all the sense in the world. So I was not expecting Pat Chun, uh, but I did think Heather Like and a few other candidates were a little bit higher on my list than than Jen Cohen was, um, but. You can definitely see the rationale for hiring Jen Cohen and why it, why it makes all the sense in the world. One, she was already preparing for a Big Ten, uh, I mean, a transition from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten. So she's going to do it in L.A., not in Seattle. But, like, you know, she was in the middle of that. So there's going to be continuity there. And, and in terms of representing USC's interests and concerns in terms of Big Ten travel, Big Ten scheduling, like, she's going to be part of that. So there's continuity with that. The other really big point is that, you know, Mike Bone uh, was pushed out because he was lazy, unprofessional. And, you know, according to a lot of people inside the athletic program at USC, you know, he created a toxic culture and his personal behavior, not appropriate. Uh, he unsettled a lot of people. Jen Cohen, you know, it's first class all the way. She's, she's so widely respected in the industry. So you're going to get a very healthy workplace culture. One of her strengths, just developing the people around her, the, developing the people who work with her. Like she's just a, an absolute first rate boss in the, in the office, in the workplace. So you have that as well. So in many ways, this is a very clear response to the ugly way Mike Bone uh, exited Jen Cohen is the antidote. She's she de definitely going to offer something different. And in terms of, you know, let's keep in mind that with the move to the Big Ten, you're going to have the athletes in the Olympic sports and in the other non-football sports, like they want the right kind of leader. They need the right kind of leader. Jen Cohen is exactly that. Uh, University of Washington, softball, volleyball, uh, uh, other programs have done really, really well. Graduation rates are excellent. Uh, Jen Cohen does check a lot of the boxes. Now, it's a, this is primarily a football show, of course, and the main thing that matters is, does Jen Cohen get along with Lincoln Riley? Does she give Riley what he needs? Does he make does she make Riley feel uh, supported, you know, fully empowered, fully resourced? That's obviously the heart of this job. There are no illusions about anything else. But you do want an athletic director at this time of transition to the Big Ten to meet a lot of different needs. And it's clear that Jen Cohen does meet a lot of those different needs, but you know, her, for football uh, expertise, um, you can raise legitimate questions about that because she's the guy, she's the AD who hired Jimmy Lake after Chris Peterson abruptly resigned. And Jimmy Lake was a disaster. Now Jen Cohen rebounded really, really well by hiring Kalen DeBoer. So maybe you, you have a, an AD who, 
under has understood more about the business through failure, you know, through a, a, a very difficult two year period at Washington. But she learned from her mistake and and delivered a home run hire with DeBoer. So, you know, someone who has truly evolved and grown and improved on the job over the last few years, you get someone like that as opposed to someone who, you know, has never made a really huge hire, uh, has never, you know, gone through that kind of high pressure moment. That is certainly an argument to make that Jen Cohen, precisely because, you know what, she hasn't nailed everything in the past, but she's learned from her mistakes. That's a mature leader. And that's, you know, the kind of person that uh, USC is getting. So there's a lot to recommend Jen Cohen, even if you think that USC could have done perhaps a little bit better, you know, all in all, you know, if she if she gives Lincoln Riley what he wants and makes Lincoln Riley feel comfortable, this thing's going to work out just fine for USC. And that really is the bigger picture. Cohen uh, has overseen 17 Pac-12 championships uh, during her time at Washington going back to 2016. So she would have been taking that AD role at a time when Chris Peterson was already the head coach. And to, to Matt's point, she was there when they went to the college football playoff in 2016. Of course, Chris Peterson stepped down after the 2019 season. Um, certainly the elevation of Jimmy Lake at that time wasn't anything that too many people seemed concerned about. So it wasn't like she made an out of the box kind of um uh, elevation there or a promotion because he was highly acclaimed as a defensive coordinator. He'd been in the system. He was touted by Chris Peterson, one of the most respected people in the sport as being ready for the job, capable and, and receiving that reference uh, from Chris Peterson. So she just certainly went along with, uh, again, not a good hire, but one, it's almost like, you know, a, a miss pick in the NFL draft in the first round that everyone agrees with. But the general manager was the one who has to live with it. And then she, again, to Matt's point, rebounded quickly with Kaylin DeBoer coming in, having a great season in year one. Here's an extra point to make about uh, Jen Cohen in light of what you just said, Mark. You know, she did the hire of Jimmy Lake was expected. Everyone felt at the time it was a good move, that it made sense, that Jimmy Lake deserved uh, a chance to be a head coach. And, you know, I lived in Seattle for 20 years. I, I do follow University of Washington with a certain degree of extra interest relative to other non-USC programs. I felt Jimmy Lake deserved it. But here was the specific mistake that, that Cohen made. It's, it's worth uh, recalling this. And there is a, a USC Lincoln Riley angle here, albeit an indirect one. The mistake Jen Cohen made when she hired Jimmy Lake, it wasn't the actual decision to hire Lake, but she obviously didn't ask Jimmy Lake, who are you going to hire as your offensive coordinator, right? Because Jimmy Lake was a defensive coordinator, brilliant defensive tactician. You know, he shut down Mike Leach's Washington State offenses in several straight Apple Cups. I mean, Jimmy Lake owned that matchup. So Jimmy Lake's defensive X and O chops first rate. But so she Cohen needed to ask, OK, what, what's your vision? What's your roadmap for the offensive side of the ball? And then we learned, you know, when Jimmy Lake became head coach, he hired John Donovan as offensive coordinator. Just an absolute disastrous hire. No one wanted John Donovan. And, of course, the results were as atrocious as everyone on Montlake feared they would be. Cohen did not, you know, did not do her homework. She did not interview Jimmy Lake for the head coaching job. She didn't ask, you know, like she didn't ask the right questions in that interview. And so, but like she, this is part of her learning process. She realized, oh, I need to have a coach who understands offense. And Kaylin DeBoer has certainly uh, filled that requirement very well. So when you think about that, it wasn't just Jen Cohen learning from a mistake, but she realized I got to be offense first. I, when I'm overseeing a football program, uh, I got to have a coach who understands offense because I could have a good defense but if my offense uh, just com completely implodes and doesn't have a, a good vision for how to maximize skill position talent, this thing's not going to get off the ground. So Lincoln Riley, as great an offensive tactician as you can find. So, and so Jen Cohen, having had her epiphany, having had her eye-opening moment at Washington with the Jimmy Lake, John Donovan 
disaster and then pivoting to Kaylin DeBoer, Jen Cohen is now in a position and she should have a mindset of offense first. What can I give uh, my coach to be as, as, as good on offense uh, as possible? It probably makes Jen Cohen a little bit more inclined to think on the same wavelength as Lincoln Riley. If Jen Cohen had not had the epiphany she did have at the University of Washington, going from Jimmy Lake to Kalen DeBoer and crashing on the rocks of that John Donovan uh, debacle, then she might not have been as uh, uh, good a choice for USC as she would be under these conditions with, you know, understanding how much Kalen DeBoer has meant to Washington football and now understanding how Lincoln Riley uh, operates. There's, there's a better chance that Cohen and Riley are, go are going to be on the same wavelength. We appreciate you all being here at the Voice of College Football USC. This is our Trojans Live that we present each and every Monday. Thanks to Matt Zemek. You can catch him on Trojans Wire. You see the um, Twitter handle right on the screen. And for Matt's Twitter handle, it's simply his name, at Matt Zemek, Z-E-M-E-K. As you see right there, Trojans Wire again for the latest in USC coverage. And this is it, folks. This is game week. We ride right into the season. It's 12 regular season games. It's hopefully a conference championship game. It's on into postseason play. So lock it in from right now through uh, December into January with Matt and myself. And we'll be here every Monday night at 8 Pacific time with all of you. And again, join us on the YouTube channel uh, membership here at the Voice of College Football USC. I I cannot uh, emphasize this enough. I enjoy the conversations with Matt. I know that the people that uh, have uh, gotten a membership are very appreciative of what we've delivered here. We've got 12 segments. That means roughly close to six hours of content, additional exclusive content here at the Voice of College Football. You can sign up right on the front page of the YouTube channel right here. Well, Matt, is there anything else uh, that we need to hit on tonight? I don't think so. Like, there's only so much you can g glean from a San Jose State game. And I think the other thing uh, to just to note is that USC fans are tired of all the talking and all the speculation that, you know, people in our line of work, Mark, like, what do we spend these eight months from January through August <laughs> doing? Speculating, hypothesizing, predicting. We want we want the hey we want the games just as much as you do if not more let's just tee it up let's kick it off let's see what we have in this team and then next Monday we can go a, a lot deeper on a lot of questions yeah we don't need to squeeze too much more blood from this turnip I would only say that you know USC and Notre Dame you want you want to check out uh, the other Voice of College football shows that Mark has going on I know he's going to have a Notre Dame uh, post game reaction from the Navy game on Saturday so. Notre Dame in the morning, USC at night, you you know, like during the season, I know that we have some Georgia fan friends and some Michigan fans, Alabama fans all looking in at these shows, uh, you know, during the season, you're going to be following your team, of course, and you should. This week, week zero, you get a special Notre Dame USC double bite at the Apple. So it's a chance to watch uh, uh, our coverage of the Irish, of the Trojans here at the Voice of College Football, and you really want to get to uh, Tim Prangley, Rick Anaya, and Tony Altimore for the USC postgame show. That's right after the game. So, you know, games last – I mean, the games might last a little shorter now with the clock running on first down. So it could be as early as 11.15 uh, in the East, 8.15 Pacific, might be closer to 11.30 in the East, 8.30. But you get the point. When that game against San Jose State ends, you head on over to – Tim Prangley, uh, Tony Altamore, Rick and I are for the post-game show. They'll be with you for post-game uh, shows throughout the season. You won't have, you know, too many other games competing with USC San Jose State in that night slot uh, in week zero on Saturday. I, uh, I think Hawaii Vanderbilt's the other uh, main night game of note. So, you know, you can watch the Rainbow Warriors and Commodores for a little bit, but then in terms of a Post game show at the Voice of College Football. Head on over here to the USC post game show. 
And however those uh, sayings go about squeezing, what, blood out of a turnip or water out of a rock, whatever those are, for as much as I completely agree with Matt, if you want a final dose of predictions, we are going through our live streams of predictions. Uh, we did the Pac-12 tonight, so if you want to know where I uh, predicted USC to finish in the Pac-12, check out the live stream over on the national channel. We're going with the ACC on Tuesday night, Big 12, SEC, Big 10 on into the weekend. So our predictions right here at the Boys of College Football uh, predicted Georgia to defeat Ohio State in the national championship last year. I kind of missed it by about that much. It was kind of a quasi semifinal national championship game of sorts last year. So we'll see how we do and where it all lands. Matt, we so much appreciate you being here. You know that. And uh, we don't have a show without you. So everybody get on over to Trojans Wire and check out Matt's work on a daily basis. Until next week, when we've got football to talk about, folks, uh, again, lock it in on Trojans Wire. Lock it in here at the Voice of College Football. And we'll see you next Monday.